Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 632 of Screw the Commute podcast. I'm here with Mike DeChocho. And don't even ask me how to spell it because there's no way I'll get it right. Uh, try 10 times in a row. We will have it in the show notes so you'll be able to find it. But just think of Miked Up, M I K E D U P. And that will be an easier way to find him. You'll hear about why in a minute. And uh, this is one of the few people that I even ever heard of uh, who is working in the field that they majored in in college. Because most of you know I'm really ragging on colleges nowadays because people are <laughs> getting degrees and, you know, competing for jobs at Starbucks. But this guy actually is working in the field. So he's kind of a unicorn, I guess. And he was a Man of the Year nominee. He'll tell you about that, too. All right, so hope you didn't miss episode 631. That was Reputable Email. This means having a good reputation. And if you mess this up, your open rates are going to tank and your spam complaints will skyrocket and, and you'll likely get kicked off your email service. And unless you're a spammer who doesn't care about this stuff, but I want you to keep that email reputation high and I tell you exactly how to do it on episode 631. And to get to a back episode, you go to screwthecommute.com slash and then the episode number, that was 631. All right, quick update on our program to get scholarships for persons with disabilities. We have three people in the program. One of them has already started his own business helping other people with disabilities. He's blind. The other one's helping her husband with her his construction website. She's blind. And then the third one is a school teacher who's uh, physically uh, got uh, disabilities. And uh, she's able to concentrate more on her studies now because she uh, the school's out. So she's been keeping up right along, and I can't wait to get her out of that uh, classroom and into her uh, home business. So uh, if you'd like to help us out with that, it's screwthecommute.com slash disability. We have a GoFundMe campaign. We're looking for our second round of financing, and we want to try to get two more people in the program. It's a pilot program uh, when I can prove the concept that we can get these people employed uh, or in their own business, then I'm going to roll it out really big to foundations and corporations and help loads of people, uh, persons with disabilities. So help us out there. All right, let's get to the main event. Uh, Mike DeChocho here is uh, the founder and president of Social Chameleon. It's a podcast agency that focuses on producing best-in-class audio and video podcasts as well as social media content. He's also the host of Miked Up, I told you about that, M-I-K-E-D-U-P, a podcast featuring inspiring entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and peak performers. And I, I don't know, he had me on there. I don't know if I'm in any of those categories, so we'll see why. Maybe he was just slumming it when they had me on there. But, uh, but Mike, are you ready to screw the commute? I'm I'm here and I'm ready, man. That was really, really well done, dude. Uh, awesome job. You have the voice for it. You have the personality for it. 632 episodes. That is consistency. And we'll talk about how consistency is key in this whole game too. But uh, absolutely an uh, honor and privilege and really excited to be here. Well, yeah, my pleasure. And what's what's the average? Isn't there some average like eight episodes that people quit on the podcast? Yeah, like like getting to 15 is worth the celebration nowadays. <laughs> uh, uh, episode 15, yeah. <laughs> I, I was, I'm too stupid to quit on things. I just keep going and going and going. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is great. You could tell that you have a passion for it. And that's uh, really like, you know, not to get all uh, – worm and fuzzy and all this stuff but you do have to have a passion for it and you can tell that you are just exuding that and uh and it, and it comes through in the show and that's why people love tuning in well thank you and the, another thing that i think we we're kind of kindred spirits is uh, you have a service above self mentality tell people about that mm -hmm. yeah to me it's like when you really get back to the heart of what you're doing why you do it you hear you know a lot of guys talk about that now um or guys and gals talk about getting back to your why, right? And Simon Sinek kind of has that whole program about it. But I think it's important for you to tie things back to what you're doing. It's bigger than you. It's not just, hey, I love to play the drums. And so I'm just going to play the drums at home in my basement. And that's that's where it goes. Like to me, it's whatever it is, your business, your, your trinket that you sell, product service, online service. 
think about how it can actually serve and help the world. And when you come with that kind of energy behind it, um, it, it, when you're struggling, you're not thinking about, oh, it's just me. I'm looking to make money. You're, you're serving people in your community. Think about your literal community or online community. And then it stretches out from that. Maybe you start to think almost like, you know, you think of like your street, you think of your city, you know, the town, right? Your state and then the country and then the world. And I really think when, when it's service above self to me, what I'm talking about is actually serving the people within my community. So I can help them up level. I mean, people help me out. And uh, when I'm doing either podcasting or entrepreneurship and talking about those two topics, it's always with the direction to inspire other people to go and unlock their greatness, turn around and then do the same for the people within their community. So that's how it is to me. It's like my goal at the end of my life in I don't know, God willing, when that will be. I'm a youngster. I consider myself a youngster. I'm only 36. So uh, God willing, I got many years ahead. And, you know, with that, with that mindset comes this responsibility of like, what's that, what's that legacy going to look like? And I don't want myself to be the only one who wins at the end of the story. That's not what I'm about. I want to really help out others. And that to me is going to be more of the legacy story is people who can say, yeah, that dude helped me out or he inspired me or I listened to a podcast and opened up the doors to this new opportunity or way of thinking. That's what, to me, service above self means. Well, why, why'd you stop at the world? What, the, what about the universe? Universe. Yeah. Hell, I mean, we're, we're, we're in, we're, how many ethers is your show in now? I think we're in like seven. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> so uh, now there's something I, I heard about you that, um, that I want, uh, I want you to give us some examples on the show here and that you are a super, high level expert in foreign languages <laughs> <laughs> tell them, did we talk tell, did we talk tell them about that did we talk about that no but languages? i i it's my business to know mike <laughs> so, so yeah you're talking about how, how at buff state um i ended up get, yeah you know they counted music as tell foreign language that. tell them about that <laughs> yeah so my whole thing is i've been playing the drums since i was old enough to <laughs> to get my hands on some literally it started with knitting needles my grandmother's those big thick knitting yep, needles from yep. way back in the day um so I, I was a musician and and played the drums in literally any school band possible that i that i could and if you're wondering well he said foreign language why are you talking about music <laughs> it's because in school there was this weird loophole and started in high school where you know you had to have your foreign language requirement and then Somehow they, when I took all the music classes, literally like jazz band, orchestra, I'd just sit in there. If I can hit the triangle, they would, they gave me an A for showing up and hitting a percussive <laughs> instrument. This is why so, I rag on higher education. I'm telling you. Th this is a true story. I literally got an A in orchestra for hitting a triangle. And then um, I love jazz band. I even did marching band and, you know, there's all the jokes about that. And I, I, I was in high school, I think when American Pie came out. So it got ragged down a little bit for all that. But it was a blast. Uh, just made lifelong friends um, playing music. And I was also in rock bands later on, but that's a different story. But the whole uh, foreign language thing is, I didn't know this at the time, but apparently all those extra music classes I was taking, and I was literally taking as many as I could because it was easy A's. <laughs> I, go, I go to Buffalo State College, which is a solid school here in town. And um, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was actually going originally for elementary education, which I'd share that story if you care to hear it. And I'm sitting down with my advisor and we're going through different credits and things that I need to hit for my, my, uh, freshman year. And they're looking at my high school stuff and I'm like, okay, cool. I was a pretty good high school student. No, no nothing to, to reveal there that I'm worried about. And they start like lighting up about this foreign language requirement. <laughs> oh my God, you're kicking butt in foreign language. And I'm like, if she asked me to say my, my name in French, I could say, je m'appelle Michelle. And that's about as good as I got. And, uh, and I was just like holding in the laughter. And I literally remember going home and like, just, just like crying, laughing that that actually works somehow, but I didn't even know that that existed. So that's just kind of the, that's the story on that. <laughs> That cracks me up. Again, like you said, why I, I rag on higher education nowadays. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but this man of the year uh, nominee thing, now that's a pretty impressive thing. But but before we you tell them what that's about, mm -hmm. uh, in today's atmosphere, you have to define what is a man. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know. It's 2022 and we record, so... <laughs> Yeah, I know that's a little touch, touch topic, whatever. Um, we could go there if you want, but no, the the man, man, and it is man and woman of the year. So that is, it, 
I don't know if it used to just be called Man of the Year, but well, it's Man and Woman of the for? Year. What was this for? Yeah, so this is for LLS, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, so what they pretty, do is... pretty good uh, accolade just being nominated. Yeah, I was nominated. Uh, I did not win, but I'll tell you what. It's one of those things where everybody wins, not right, to sound corny, right. but we're raising money for blood cancer. So literally, like coming in second place, you raised money for blood cancer. So we ended up raising over $150,000 nice. for blood cancer, which, I mean, if that's chalked it up as a loss, no. I mean, <laughs> right. that's, a, that's a huge win. Um, it just, you know, the, the guy who ended up winning it, like he had some really amazing connections, which was cool to see that people stepped up and uh all the power to them uh, I, I to me it was an interesting time in life and to even get involved in this project or campaign uh, was a really cool opportunity and I'll, I'll share something with you I talked about service about self when i reconnected with a friend funny enough we've talked about buff state college a friend of mine sarah her and i took some production classes at buff state and um we kind of lost touch. Like a lot of people in college, you have a couple classes with them. You remember them. You remember, always have those fun moments together. And then life kind of happens. You 22 years old, you start growing up. You, you know, a lot of times people get married, have kids, and you don't really see a lot of the people you hang out with in college. And it wasn't like someone, Sarah wasn't someone who I necessarily hung out with outside of our classes or anything. We just knew of each other and, and you know, liked each other. Like it was just a, a, a good friend to have and someone you respected. So Interestingly enough, 10 years later, she is in this marketing role. I believe it was marketing, but she was kind of running the the Buffalo campaign for the first year ever that LLS was in Buffalo. So it was kind of like a Western New York, um, you know, when people wonder where, where I'm, when I say I'm in New York, they think New York City. I'm in Western New York, which is very close to the uh, Canadian border here in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. So first time we're doing the inaugural uh, campaign. And uh, she invites me out for a cup of coffee to to kind of share this whole thing with me. And I was interested. And the reason I was, my ears perked up is I have a little cousin, Ben, who's now four years old. Um, he was two or three at the time of this campaign and he was battling leukemia, wow. you know? And so uh, a lot of children, you know, uh, blood cancers, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I forget if it's 40% of cancers in children are blood cancers. Don't hold me to the number. But I remember learning something pretty eye-popping that um, it was, it, it's definitely a known problem. And then the fact is the money is going to research, you know, to obviously to, to better help uh, fight this stuff, right? And so there's, you know, um, it, it just to me was, was important. You know, not only if, if whether or not I had a family member that was involved, uh, that's one thing. But, you know, my father had cancer. It wasn't leukemia, but he had... Um, you know, he had colon cancer. So I've had family members battle through cancer to see a little, you know, to see a three-year-old kid Mm. fighting through it is a whole different thing. And uh, we also had a couple kids that represented the program in Buffalo that we got to meet. Um, I believe the little girl's name was Lexi and and, and the the little boy's name is slipping my mind right now, but we got to see people who are really going through it. Right. So we got to meet him in person. And when she's pitching this whole thing to me, Mind you, I'm a young entrepreneur going through a lot of my own trials and tribulations at the time. And, you know, in entrepreneurship, I was in my, well, let's see when this was two, three years ago. I was like two or three years in the business because I'm just about to celebrate my five-year anniversary Mm -hmm. with Social Chameleon. So I had no reason, I'll just tell you, to to say yes to this. I think 99 out of 100 people with rightfully so, my family included, were like, dude, you don't have time, energy. Um, you need to really take care of yourself right now. Is that kind of a, a tipping point thing in the business where I was like, approve it? Like, pardon my French because I'm, I, I know how to speak French, like we just <laughs> talked about. Shit or get off the pot, right? Yeah, so, that's French. Um, that's basically, you know, what, what, the, what I was hearing from my friends and family um, that love and care, me, care about me, but they knew that I was crushing it in business before I became an entrepreneur and they didn't understand why I would leave a great situation for this new one. And uh, so I get it, everybody, you know, nobody believes in me the same, uh, even close to the amount that personally that you, you have from within. So I could have easily told her no, is my point. So when she was asking me like, hey, I, I identify you as someone like, you know, you have a nice social media following, you do good things in, in Buffalo. We love to like, well, what have was you she part. asking you? I'm not clear on what she was asking from you. 
So to be nominated for man of the year, um, you're campaigning for, I want to say it was 10 weeks. Oh, it was I see. pretty I see. considerable time. So on my social media, in my emails, knock, 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 door to door, mm-hmm. um, I was asking for, you know, different sponsorships or uh, people to donate to Got LLS. Okay. So no, I was I essentially kind of uh, being the face of it. So there was about five guys, five girls in Buffalo that all represented this campaign. So they were going saying, hey, I'm a candidate for man of the year 2022 or whatever it was. I mean, it, I think it was 2020. We we're doing it. What's also interesting is it was in the middle of the pandemic. So when I said yes to this, I think it was in November. And then it was um, kind of like the pregame. We were going to meetings and uh, I agreed to, to do it. I was really excited about it. Um, but then the fall rolls around and March is kind of when the whole country understood that the pandemic was very real in the States. And so we actually, I was campaigning, asking people for money in times when people were losing their jobs. Oh, so they didn't okay. know about yeah. health, safety. It was, it was very difficult. So for us to raise one hundred fifty thousand dollars, I think is nothing to 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 scoff at. I mean, that was something I'm extremely proud of, and that was collectively the whole group of us did that together. Um, and you know, I had to build a team. That was one of the things they asked of me. So I was doing Zoom meetings with a bunch of friends that we were called Mike's Warriors, and you know, we were raising money um, throughout you know different places. It was all all for the Buffalo uh, LLS you know chapter, but you know, I had a friend, one of my buddies that I've known since I was a little kid. Uh, he's out in Colorado. He was one of the guys on my team because we were able to do everything remotely. So it was kind of interesting. I said yes to this. Um, Did you have the, the podcast whole, going at the time? Had the podcast going. So I was mentioning it on the podcast okay, and right. guests. And I've had a couple of people on the show that were tied to it mm-hmm. that I would have had on anyways, but it was kind of like, oh, since you're talking about this, let's we'll talk about the campaign. Um, but I'll just share this little inside story. I don't know how many people I've told this to maybe one or two if that, but when she was asking me, I felt this like turmoil, this contradiction of, you know, I, I was kind of known as the guy would say yes to everything. Cause I always want to help and figure it out, right, especially right. if it's a tug, tug at my heart. But I, I did tell her like, I have to, I have to let, like marinate with this one. I just have to make sure if I'm going to do it, I don't want to half-ass it. I'm not going to mm-hmm. give you guys half of my effort, half of my time. I'm not that kind of person. I go all in. And I, I had to know if I hadn't, all in if that was even a switch on the switchboard that i could give because i already was all in with business and my podcast and everything so uh, i remember just kind of like looking for a sign and um you know listening to a song at the time and and the lyric was a chili pepper song and it said in you a star is born was the lyric and i know it's not talking about stars like as far as oh i'm gonna get like accolades or anything like that but I, i just got this sense this feeling of like that was a little wink I needed of saying like, you know, you're, you're moving in the right direction. Like you're doing the right thing. And so, um, you know, I, I, I said, you know, let's do this. I just needed a little bit of a nudge and it was a great opportunity. I made a lot of friends in LLS and I strengthened, you know, I got to talk to Sarah every week. It was really fun uh, getting to know her a little bit better too. And like I said, we raised a good, good chunk of change and leukemia is no joke. I mean, it's a very serious, you know, disease in, um, blood cancer is something that, um, you know, you, you don't like to see anybody go through it, but especially kids. So that's what really hit it, hit my heart. And that's Amazing. why I agreed to do it. That's yeah. Good so, for you. Good for you. It's a, uh, it's a good payback. Now, now, um, there's two major things I want to talk to you about. One mm-hmm. is, uh, you had jobs before you started your social chameleon business. So my, mm-hmm. my main uh, question is not so much as what they were, but how you made the transition. Did you just quit cold turkey and start your business or just save up money? How did you transition from working at a job to uh, starting your own business? So I was a cold turkey guy. Uh, okay. And part of that was uh, Did you have money saved up? Yes and no. I'll share, I'm going to give you the real okay. story. I don't know. Again, this is pretty cool that you're, you've done your homework on me, which I like. Uh, you know, a lot of times people just have you on. They're like, okay, talk. You know, it's like, <laughs> okay. Well, Tom, you, you've done your homework. Um, yeah, I did quit to- cold turkey. I had a call it corporate America job. I was a store manager, uh, did, you know, two and a half million dollars in sales that year, which was above goal and just doing really well. Um, 31 years old at the time, making more money than friends, family, and, uh, you know, people I knew, uh, that I was close to, but I'm not trying to say that as a brag. I'm just saying like, there was no reason that I would, you know, I, for, in other people's eyes that I'd want to leave the situation I was in, everything was good. You know, 
I, uh, I wanted that store manager job so bad because I was a sales rep for two years previous to that. And then I got that promotion later on. Um, there's actually a few years where I was, uh, I did insurance sales too, to kind of learn the process of consultative selling and going out and networking and sitting at people's kitchen tables and, and learning the sales process. But in the moment when I decided to be an entrepreneur, there was something else driving the decision. Uh, there's kind of two things going on. First of all, my self-belief was really growing and it was, I have to thank podcasting for it. And that's why I have such a big place in my heart for podcasting is because I was listening to guys like Lewis House, who was sharing his mm -hmm. story. Um, he, if you, just real quick with Lewis, he was an arena football player who was about to go, you know, he had the talent to go pro and bust his, uh, I think he broke his arm and his chances just were dwindling. And he was living on a sister's couch for some months before he, you know, got into business and he got into LinkedIn. He was afraid to meet people. He shares his story, how he goes into Toastmasters and gets comfortable on the microphone. And now he has like a top 10 podcast in the world and he's a highly successful business person. So there was that story. Ed Milet was another show I was listening to. Uh, he talked about having the water turned off and how him and his wife had to sneak into the pool at their apartment complex and shower in this back little thing. And he had to hold up a a towel so he would protect anyone from being able to see his wife as they embarrassingly took a shower outside in the pool. Stuff like that. Um, him talking about having his last $18 and he had to go to the ATM to try to take 20 bucks out and he couldn't even take money out for lunch because he didn't have enough money to even have the machine spit something out. It said insufficient funds. Feeling like the hairs in my arm uh, stand up when I heard these people talk about being rock bottom and now seeing the level of success they're at. And I wasn't chasing necessarily dollar amount or um, status of what they had, but what I was chasing is seeing them in their light, shining and doing beautiful things in the world. Both of those guys are all about giving back and serving. And so they were great influences for me and an inspiration. And so I knew that there was something in me. I, I felt that the universe was ready to use me um, in a way that can help others. And I knew that just being in corporate sales and, and doing good for the company, I knew that something was missing. My fulfillment, even when I would crush a goal, my fulfillment was off because I, I knew that I wasn't in necessarily the industry and or position that I, I felt that was the right one for me. So uh, I think it's equivalent to like when someone is like an athlete, they're just a freak athlete, but they don't stick with it because that's not fulfilling to them. And people don't get it because they're trying to write their story. Like you're tall, you should play basketball. It's like, <laughs> If that dude or gal isn't into it, no, they shouldn't play basketball. That's not their calling, you know? So um, it was eating away at me for quite some time. I was doing well. I felt like the company didn't totally appreciate me. They didn't really get and understand what I was doing behind the scenes. They just cared about the numbers on a sheet of paper. And when, when the numbers were there, I didn't hear from anybody. And if we had a struggle or a team struggle, you know, like a, an employee situation or whatever, it was you know, it, it, there was a lot of drama that uh, I don't necessarily like. I'm a pretty drama free guy and that's how I handle things, but drama happens and you have to address it. So stuff was going on. And speaking of drama, I said two deciding factors. One was lack of fulfillment. Two was I was going through a divorce. Mm. Talk about drama. So I was in a, a marriage, um, you know, about just about seven years in, we have at that point in time, we had a, our daughter was two, Isabel, and she's now seven. So this is in 2017 and I was faced with this feeling of like my, almost like my wife was kind of turning her back on me. I'm in this business. I'm blood, sweat and tears in it. I'm not even fulfilled there. I'm listening to these podcasts. These guys are doing this incredible stuff and all of them started with almost nothing or they had something and lost it all and came back. And I looked in the mirror at my apartment cause I was separated from my wife. So I got my own apartment, nothing in the apartment was set up yet. All my belongings were in boxes. It was like the first, two days I was there. Right. right. And, uh, I look in the mirror and I just remember asking myself, like, who do you want to be? You know, like right now I felt like I, in that moment, I felt like I became a guy who was the right guy for my marriage. I was making money. Um, I thought I felt I was a good father and a good person. Um, but I wasn't really doing anything that, you know, a, the little, the 10 year old version of myself, which was in the media production and all kind and music and stuff like that. I wasn't even doing any of that stuff anymore. And B this, this self-belief in myself that I could go and be an entrepreneur was starting to really, um, 
it's like the the water was boiling and now it was really it's heating up 212 degrees or whatever it is right mm-hmm. so i was to that point i was ready to do something and i think the divorce was kind of the straw that was like you know jim carrey's uh he said this quote about his father his dad uh, was an accountant and i jim has a a big family, I believe, like nine brothers and sisters, something crazy. And they were living like in a van at one point, all kinds of crazy stuff. And his dad, um, he was an accountant. And when he was 50 years old, was was fired, basically, like pack up your box. He's walking down the stairs. And Jim remembers seeing this as a kid. And, and he said, the worst thing in the world is, you know, failing is not the worst thing. He goes, the, the worst thing that can happen to you, and hopefully I don't botch this, but basically the worst thing that can happen is, that you compromise for your dreams and then you still fail. So Jim Carrey's dad was actually like a good jazz musician, but he never pursued that because he needed to make money to support his family. So he became an accountant. He hated it, but he did it for the family and he got fired. So you could still lose at the Mm -hmm. things you compromise. And that is what I felt. I felt I made all these compromises in my marriage to be this guy that I felt was the right guy for the marriage. And then when that didn't come you know, to fruit or it didn't work out going through the divorce. I, I just had this really sick feeling of like, man, like I could have just went and been in a rock and roll band in <laughs> yeah, those, right. ten, those 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I could have just, or I could do whatever. And, you know, but looking back at it with a more mature head on my shoulders, uh, I have, I have a beautiful daughter. I do everything the same way for her. And, and she's my number one. Um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot through marriage. I learned a lot in those businesses I was involved with. Um, and so I did decide to, to, to go cold Turkey, but I just wanted to build kind of the world of scenes so you can understand mm-hmm. this guy who just felt, felt like everything turned around on him. And, um, and then you asked me if I had money saved, I did probably the craziest thing you could do is I depleted my 401k at, uh, 31 years old, which I didn't care because I had, uh, I think like 20 grand saved in there. Right. But I, I also said, realized to myself, I'm 31. Like, if I can't make 20 grand back by the time I'm ready to <laughs> <Right>. retire, <laughs> I like, I may as well just, you know, I hate to sound graphic here, but like, I may as well just put a, a hole between my ears. You know what I mean? Like, 20 grand shouldn't be what I'm going to retire on and have a, you know, uh, a nice place on the on the sand somewhere. That's not <laughs> a, a, a big enough chunk of change. I felt it was playing money. It was basically going gambling. Um, for a weekend. uh, You know what I'm saying? So what I did is I I took that 20 grand and after all the percentages are zapped out of it and everything, I ended up being like real money. It was like $13,000. And it ended up allowing me to to live in this apartment for about a year, you know, and I didn't have to worry about making one sale for a year. um, And I could still have a roof over my head. Now I had to pay other things that I wasn't necessarily prepared to pay, like, you know, child support and all Mm -hmm. the stuff that um, it comes with a divorce that's unfortunate and it was supposed to be a 50, 50 divorce. That's a whole nother podcast episode. Um, you know, guys in New York state pretty much, uh, get, get it, uh, taken to them. But I, uh, I feel everything happens for you. You know, I came out of that situation, learning a lot, self-reflecting a lot. And I knew that I wanted to make a change and I wanted to do it right away. And I personally feel like why I did cold Turkey was, if you ever put a foot on, if you got one foot on sand or on land, if you can picture this, and then one foot on like a rock in the middle of like a, call it the ocean or whatever, and you could just kind of go back and put it back on on land, you're always going to have that safety net. Mm-hmm. But if you take someone and you throw them in the middle of the damn ocean, and now they have to get back, right? And you burn all the ships, as they say. I had to learn how to swim, and I had to learn how to swim in shark-infested waters. And it was literally an education that I couldn't get in the, in the classroom. Um, it was a, it, it was a bloody drop down and drag out, uh, whatever that was called, like a big, it was like a, basically a, a, you know, 10 round boxing match. You know what I mean? Um, and so, but at the same time, I would absolutely do it, do it over again that same way, but comma, a big, but here, <laughs> I, I would also, the thing I would have done differently is I would have had more education up front, but that doesn't mean I would have started any later. So what I would have done is like, while I was in corporate America for the last maybe six months, I would have done like two hours of reading a night or something. Right, exactly. And then, and then, yeah. And then when I transition, 
I wouldn't necessarily need to have like an LLC yet or even a business concept yet or anything. I mean, that, that could always benefit if you have that stuff ironed out first. But the thing for me is I knew I needed to burn the ships. Otherwise I was just going to easily come back and be like, oh, okay, I'm ready to go back to this again. You know? Um, no, I, I, I didn't give myself the option. So I'm going to figure this thing out whatever it takes. And it took, you know, some, hum oh, it took a lot of humbling. Um, and it took a lot of, you know, being okay with eating whatever you can get your hands on at, at the end of those 12 months. And, you know, my family ended up, um, you know, they, they kind of saw me, I had a little bit of that crash and burn and they just couldn't believe that I would keep fighting that way. And I did that, you know, for the first few years, um, because I had to figure out how to make it work. And one of the things I did uh, was I transitioned and I started my podcast first before I can transition there. But in 2019, I felt this uh, heart tug where I felt I wanted to launch my own show, which thank you for mentioning that in the beginning, Mike'd Up. It's a play on my name, Mike, and then D for DeChocho. So uh, M-I-K-E-D up, like you said, with the exclamation. And why I started it was to help other people who were going through the crazy shit I was going through but also I was interviewing people who had the solutions, been there, done that, and had the success story mm -hmm. tied to it. So A, I was learning from all these people. B, I was becoming friends and community, you know, um, you know, brothers and sisters with everybody. And just, just, we were, we were in it together and C, I was offering all this great information to an audience that really needed it. And, and that felt fulfilling to me. I felt like I was serving in that way. And I felt I had a gift, um, on the microphone. I thought I was a, a great host and, and um, I have had people come back to me and say that I'm doing a great job. So I believe them and the people who say it. And thank you very much, mom. No, uh, <laughs> there's, other, there's other people who come to me saying that I'm in and in, in working on my purpose. And uh, so that's why I did mic'd up. But what ended up happening is I didn't know that that was going to lead me into the business transition that it did. The key word in 2020 was pivot. Everybody mentioned right. it, talked about pivot. The two P words were pandemic and pivot. Well, Previous to that, another P word, previous to that, I ended up um, actually starting mic'd up in, in 2019. So before the pandemic, or just before I was known in America, I should say, November. And one month after that, I was doing, uh, so before I was in podcasting, just to let the audience understand what I was doing, I was building websites. I was getting people on the first page of Google, um, doing like email marketing for people, uh, videos, social media ads, running Facebook pages, Instagram, that whole thing. So Social Chameleon was more of like a social media marketing company and also digital media and marketing. Kind of, I don't want to say generic, but we were doing almost everything. We had a lot of offers out there. And one of my friends uh, who is also an entrepreneur, he knew that I had a media production background. And he's like, hey, you know how to edit audio and video and stuff. Do you think you can do my podcast? And I was like, sure. So I was doing it for pretty much, you know, lunch money. And I was happy to help him out. Did about 50 episodes for him. And I thought, this is pretty cool. I, I enjoy this. I can get paid for it. Uh, helping a friend out basically to get the learning experience. And then I launched my show with the knowledge I just learned helping a friend out, right? And so Mike Dup starts off like literally on a zero budget. All I did was I bought my blue Yeti microphone, like <laughs> most podcasters do on day one. And I started my show. And one month later, one of the video clients that I just did a testimonial for, they, they were really happy with our work. She said she saw my email blast come out, that I had a new podcast. She liked the way it looked, sounded and everything and was professional. And even though she didn't know, I was basically learning it as I went at that time. And I said, well, hey, thanks so much. I appreciate that. And her response blew me away. She goes, our company, our board of directors has been getting together for months now and have, they've been talking about starting a podcast for our, our business. And this was like in 2019. So it's a little bit forward thinking. Now it seems like, you know, almost every company is thinking this way. But at that time, it was a little bit more forward thinking. And I, I was kind of taken aback, like, oh, that's a cool idea that you guys are, uh, you know, it's kind of a different company. They were um, a, a group of people who, it was like buying and selling trades for uh, big equipment, used equipment in the uh, construction industry. So I'm like, huh, how podcasting? I mean, these guys are in trucks all day long. So you got a captive audience. That would be, that, that mm -hmm. makes sense. So when I talked to them, I thought they wanted me to teach them how to do it. I was like the dumb and dumber moment. <laughs> so, you know, the dumb and dumber scene where yeah. uh, with, the, with the, the bikini models on the bus, uh, the, it was like Brazilian bikini right. models. And they're looking for two guys. 
<laughs> happen to be two guys they're looking for that could help them get waxed up before their bikini shows. <laughs> and it's, it, you know, it's, it's the two guys, Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels out there. And uh, the, the bus pulls up and asks him, Hey, we're looking for two boys who can come on tour with us right now. And, and they're like, Oh my God, there's a town five miles down that way. I'm sure you'll find some guys. <laughs> and then the bus takes off like a bunch of idiots that, you know, the girls are like stunned. They're like, these two guys just shut us down, not not realizing that they're they're just they're stupid and they're dumb and didn't get it. So then they look at each other and they're like, "Oh my God, we're so stupid! How do we pass this up?" So they they're waving their hands. They get their attention. They go, "We're sorry, the town's actually five miles down that way, right?" <laughs> so I I had my dumb and dumber moment. What happened was they asked me, "Hey, you're like you're you're kicking butt with your podcast? Can you help us?" And I literally took that as like help help teach them how to do it. Um, and they're like, dude, we don't want you to teach us. We want you to just do it for us. I was like, oh, score. So I put together a proposal. They wrote me a check. And at that point in time, uh, they probably didn't realize this, but it was the largest check I ever received in business. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I was like, whoa, I can actually, cause I was used to making, like I said, lunch money, mm -hmm. uh, doing podcasting. And I was like, oh, this company's actually going to pay me like legit, you know, a, a good, a good amount of money to do this. And then I realized a, I loved it. B, now I see that there's a proven concept. If I can get paid once for something, I can get paid twice. So I started to do some online videos and talk to people about starting a podcast. And it got so much more traction than anything else I ever did. The other stuff, I think people were like, they were just sick of and tired of hearing about like, you know, SEO and all this stuff. It's like, it just get, it ran its course. Like, you know, optimizing your website. Right, like right. how many times do you get hit up in your LinkedIn box about people who can optimize your website? It's like every single day I get like 10 of them. So, you know, at the time, not too many people were helping. And now, now it's a lot more, um, you know, common. But at the time, I was kind of getting known as the podcast guy, just helping people do it. And I literally taught myself. I YouTube my way through it. And I admit that. But I, um, I got very good at the craft of it all. And then I, I'd pick up my second client, third client. And then people started to hire me as a consultant to teach. Like there were some that wanted to learn how to do it and do it themselves. And after about a year, my sales started to really go into the right direction. I wouldn't say I was, you know, making anything I'm going to write home about, but I was um, definitely showing a significant increase in, in, in profit and, and things are going well to the point where the first company, the, the first days of the company, it was me, myself, and I, all three of us were the team. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I got you were some, employee I, of the month every month. I was employee of the <laughs> month every month. All hats were worn. And like six months later, all of a sudden I was working on so many shows I, at the time I was working 12 hours a day, which is still common today. But what happened was I ended up hiring, you know, I brought an intern on, taught him how to do it. Then all of a sudden the two of us were full capacity, brought another person on, right? Then we realized, Hey, we need to get someone to write show notes and we need to, you know, have someone manage it all. Um, so it became this really cool thing where a business was born through this it started as a passion project me doing the podcast and then all of a sudden it became something that people were willing to pay for and i pivoted the business so we were no longer uh, kind of marketing ourselves as this social media marketing company we flipped it to social chameleon it's podcasting done for you and we ended up leading with that and i i'll, I'll share this like a lot of people say oh you you did cold turkey and you didn't really prepare and all this stuff well, you have to understand, I would have never been where I'm at today, which is now the company's profitable and doing well. I would never be where I'm at today if I never got started because you have to learn. You have to, it's like a ball of clay. You, you play with it a little bit, you, you know, you shape it into different things. That doesn't work. You reshape it into something else until you kind of find your stride. And um, I, I remember seeing a video when I was learning about entrepreneurship and this guy used like basic shapes, elementary shapes to tell the story. And I, and I learned that. And that's part of the reason I was willing to get started first and kind of figure it out as I went is he talks about in, in sales, like if in month one, you start your company and you're selling, uh, the object looks like a star, right? So it's got a lot of points and a lot of sides on it and you sell three of them and you're like, okay, well, we're marking this down a lot of production going into, we only sell three then you're, um, you're looking at, you know, product reviews and two of the three people said it was too many sides. It's kind of pointy, whatever. So then you turn it into a triangle. The next month you sell 10 of them. You go, oh, I went from three to 10 sales. Pretty good. 
and then you take the reviews and then more people were talking about it and then you turn it into a square and eventually a circle. The thing doesn't even have sides anymore. And now you're selling thousands of them. And it's like, shit, I would have never got to that point in selling this product if I didn't start with this, with the star. So my point is that's, that's what social chameleon was. It was get started, help businesses out, figure out what I can do to help people out, monetize it. And then as it went, I found the thing I fell in love with, which was podcasting. And then it just made sense for us to specialize instead of being the hero for everybody and too many options. We're, we're the solution for a very specific need, which is people who want a podcast, but they don't want to do the back end work. They want it all done for them. All right. So let me, uh, we're running short on time here, but um, so give us three things, three mistakes people make when they want to start a podcast. Uh, mistake number one, this might sound corny, but not getting started. They just keep talking about it. And, you know, um, but mistake number two is once you get started, uh, just assuming like that, it's okay to be sloppy, right? So uh, unedited stuff, people just um, record like a zoom file. And then they think like, Oh, I can now I have a video podcast, and they don't really edit it. Um, I, and I, I would say number three, um, I, that would be a little bit more detailed one mistake that podcasters make. The third most common one is um, a lack of, of utilizing micro content. So micro content is something I don't see enough people doing basically you and i just talked for 45 minutes you could chop this thing up into so many different bits and and promote it um audio and video there's audiograms if it's a video podcast um, people can be doing reels they can turn it into a square video they can take a quote graphic out of it they can share the cover art so there's literally like three to five pieces of content if not more from each episode that you can take and it also becomes evergreen like three months from now if you wanted to do something about um, entrepreneurship and someone getting started, you could take this sound bite and you can use it in three months from now. Nobody knows or cares that it happened. We recorded in August, right? So I'd say that's the biggest mistake I see people doing is they have this mound of content and they just promote it once the day it comes out and then they forget about it. All right. So how do you work with people and who's the best uh, client for you? We're working with organizations right now, and it also could be like solopreneurs, people who are forward thinking. And also, um, I do care that the companies we work with, we also believe in what their mission is. It doesn't have to be like 100% lockstep, um, but we are also looking to work with organizations doing cool things and inspiring things in the world. So that's usually kind of step one when we're doing the discovery call to see that it's actually a company we like and we care about and we have a good feeling. If, if someone's just doing it because they're like, we want to start a podcast to monetize it and they have no passion about the show or care about it. They just want the, the green uh, check at the end of the day. Um, it, typically that's not exactly a good fit for us. So we want to make sure it's a, an organization doing the right thing. Um, we're also looking for someone who's going to be committed like yourself to consistency. 632 episodes is something to be very proud of. I'm um, just getting, you're just getting warmed up. I'm just yeah. getting warmed so, up. Yeah. But a, but, but a company, like we're, we're looking to work with people that are dedicated to more than like, oh, we'll commit to the first month and see how it goes. Like, no, the best shows are the best shows. Joe Rogan was nobody after one month of podcasting. So um, we're looking for people who are like, yeah, this is going to be a part of our marketing. This is a part of our long-term play. And we want to work with a company who cares about it as much, if not more than we do. And so that, that'd be a good fit. Um, we're not necessarily just looking for like if two buddies are like, Hey, we want to talk about dungeons and dragons. And like, that's not necessarily our, our fit. I have no problem with that. Or if a fantasy football show or girls want to talk about uh, something that's important to them, or, you know, we're looking to do any kind of content where we feel like it can give back. I mean, we have, we have one show we're doing right now. That's um, an eighties kind of throwback show. That's a family member of mine reached out to me. Hey, can you produce this? And we said, sure. But that we weren't going out of our way to go find that kind of content. Um, we're more so looking for like the entrepreneurial, business minded, um, usually kind of like personal help, self help, that kind of stuff. All right. So, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Best way, I'm the most active on Instagram. So, if someone wants to like see my content or, or uh, get in touch, you could do it that way. And it's simply, you know, Instagram, you go to Mike DeChocho. So, just type the whole thing in. 
Um, and that'll be clickable in the show notes. You guys don't have to worry about spelling the last name like Tom joked. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> but because it's D I C I O C C I O, and I don't expect anybody to remember that. So uh, if you actually go to mikeduppodcast.com, I made it easy. So you just go to mikeduppodcast.com. That routes you to my link tree. And on my link tree of my social media, and you have all the ways you can listen to the podcast mic'd up. Um, and that would be the best way. And I'm also active on LinkedIn. So if you guys are really like LinkedIn heavy and that's where you you like to hang out the most, then drop me a DM and just let me know you heard me on Tom's show. And uh, I'd love to get to know you guys a little bit more one-on-one. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think uh, uh, he uh, promised some kind of discount if uh, if you have to have a consultation or something like that. So so thanks so much for coming on, Mike. Uh, my, uh, if, for those of you who have heard anything in the background, I've got a rescue dog here, and she's freaking out because there's a thunderstorm coming up. So that's why you hear that noise in the background. But, uh, but thanks so much, man. Yeah, thank you very much. And you're absolutely right. Anybody who's listening to this and mentions that uh, they heard the show on uh, through this uh, podcast, I'll, I'd happily do um, you know fifty dollars credit towards a one-on-one session with me to, to learn how to launch your podcast, and be happy to help out. There you go, folks. It's Mike the Chocho, and we'll have all those links in the show notes, so you don't have to worry about spelling. And uh, thanks, Mike, and we will catch you all on the next episode. See you later.